Man, that sunset is gorgeous. Grill, patio, sunset. Hard to get better than that. Unless you're browsing Carvana's inventory while you soak it all in. Oh, burger time. So sit back, get comfortable. Carvana's got thousands of cars under $20,000 just waiting for you. I could stay here forever. Carvana, where car buying meets comfort meets convenience. Download the app or visit Carvana.com today. That's not just the sound of that first sip of Morning Joe. It's the sound of someone shopping for a car on Carvana from the comfort of home. That's a good blend. It's time to take it easy, like answering some easy questions to get pre-qualified for a car in minutes. Talk about starting the morning right. Just like customizing your terms so your car fits your budget. Mm, mm, mm. Visit Carvana.com or download the app to experience car shopping the way it should be. Convenient. Comfortable. Ah. Well, hello and welcome to the Growth Mindset Podcast. Join me, Sam Harris, on my journey of curiosity and growth. I have conversations with some of the world's most fascinating humans, from billionaires to Olympians, and most everyone in between, such as suspiciously happy people and even a hitman. Success isn't just for successful people, it is earned and you can earn it too. I find out how ordinary people become extraordinary to fuel your own growth mindset. Welcome to the podcast. I hope you are doing well and making the most of the time in lockdown. Much as I personally hope to just chill out a lot and play music and write books, I've become a little bit busy working on my own new app idea to hopefully improve all our lives a little. I'm building an app for being social with your podcast listening time, because personally, I get so frustrated by listening to great podcasts, but being unable to talk about them with my friends. The amazing things you hear, it's just so annoying that like my other friends haven't heard the same thing at the same time. And You make recommendations to people, but it's hard to listen to the same things on the same day or ever then have a conversation about the thing because you've probably forgotten about it by the time they listen. So my new app, Syncify, lets you connect with your friends in the app directly and you can listen live together at the exact same time to the exact same thing. Or you can see what your friend listened to that day earlier and you can just catch up on it. And that way you can share the ideas that you have in your head. And I figured it's just a really nice way to combat isolation right now by sharing the same experiences. And you get to learn a lot more by having conversations and seeing other people's points of views. And you also get the motivation to follow up on the great ideas that you have whilst you're listening. And also you get to discover the new content that your friends love and just share your interesting highlights. So many things to make podcast experiences better because of podcast apps are crap and annoy the hell out of me. So I had to fix it. Anyway, you can sign up for the waitlist at syncifyapp.com if you're interested and I'll totally let you try the beta. So yes, that has made me a little bit busy and I have done less chilling out and creating than I hoped in this time, but I hope that you are chilling out and enjoying life. On the podcast today, we have Kate Boyle and she is just such an awesome, inspiring, creative and fun human being. She worked as a writer in the movie industry for Warner and other big names in LA. She then started her business Banjo Robinson which was funded by Techstars and now Sesame Ventures. And Banjo is a really cool business for any parent right now with kids at home. And it's hard to explain exactly, but you'll learn about it more in the podcast. But basically, Banjo is a magical cat who can become a pen pal for your child and he will send them fun letters from his adventures across the world and he'll teach them interesting things. Now, kids really love it. I mean, they go nuts and they just enjoy writing to him and it's just a really useful educational tool as well as being fun. And so I'm actually genuinely a little bit jealous of kids these days that get to write to a cool magical cat that travels the world. I I didn't have a cool pen pal when I was young and I kind of feel like I missed out. Anyway, Kate is a super awesome human working to make the world a more magical place and I'm sure you're going to enjoy our conversation. So without further ado, this is Kate Boyle, the CEO of Banjo Robinson. So I guess it's nice to start with a bit of a life story. I've heard lots of different things and stuff, so it sounds like we have a lot to talk about. So I went to all-girls school, very academic secondary school, pretty much all-girl university course. Then I went to study in Copenhagen, always loved travel. 
I'd studied a bit in France. I did a semester at the University of Copenhagen. And then in my late 20s, I'd been working for a film director who did a lot of business in LA. And from kind of quite slow moving film industry work that was happening sort of nine to five, then at five o'clock, LA would wake up and suddenly the phone calls would be very different and the attitude on the other end of the line would be very different. And there would be sort of yeah, let's do it. You know, like let's do this deal. Let's get it done. Let's get it moving. And it was very dynamic and energized. And, and I ended up really falling in love with that way of working. And so I moved to America and I lived in Los Angeles for eight years. And I went there to work at the beginning. The only way I could get a visa was to work in the mailroom at William Morris, which was, I thought, the worst thing in the world to happen. But actually, it, was, it couldn't have been anywhere better to land when you're trying to kind of navigate Hollywood than to be in a mailroom of, you know, one of the best agencies out there. So then that was me and I don't know, about 400 men and a couple other girls in this company. So close to the show Entourage that it's almost kind of weird for me watching Entourage because there's no parody. It's so similar. Like I had agents that just behave crazy. It was just a mad environment. And then from there, I went to work as a general assistant to a writer called Eitan Cohen and ended up becoming a script development exec. And I'm sort of helping him with a bunch of stuff. He was working on Men in Black 3, so we did uh, a couple of different studio picture developments, so worked at Paramount on a movie, went to the Warner Brothers lot on a movie, mostly at Sony, but we did, the majority of time was on um, Men in Black, so we were doing, putting together writers' rooms and flying to New York and doing table reads and production drafts and I uh, think you know, he wrote a script in the beginning that sort of green ripped that franchise. And there's a huge amount of money tied up in that. So it's a sort of a $300 million movie. So lots and lots of people with vested interests in it working out from the producer to the executive producer to the studio execs to the development guys to the director. And even in a film like that, it's the main actor as well. Will Smith has a bunch of say. So lots of cooks. And then, of course, the writer, Aton Cohen, and the writing team. So... My life story has sort of deviated to a writer's room in uh, yeah. New York in yeah. 2014. But yeah. And then what's happened recently? It was really impactful because when I left Los Angeles, I came back without a plan. And I sort of knew it was going to be okay, but I wasn't equally expecting a period of confusion and depression because I, I had left a life and a job, a career, a relationship, a home all my friends and then came back to London sort of after an eight year sabbatical Mm -hmm. and had to start again. And I knew that that would be hard, but it was compounded by London being quite an expensive city and me not having any money and me sort of stubbornly not wanting to do film anymore. It really wasn't interested in doing that long format three year development cycle. So I was sort of keen to do something that felt fun and a bit more wholesome and a bit more good in the world in my sort of view and I really didn't know what that was. So I started just doing things that I liked. And uh, my friends had all had children, so I was hanging out with them a lot. And I love literature, so I was hanging out in bookshops a lot. And I was buying children's books for children. And I was thinking, oh, this is a nice short format. This doesn't take three years of development time and, you know, $300 million. You can just kind of have an idea, make a story happen and see a kid smile. So I started writing letters to my friend's children from a cat character called Banjo Robinson. And I was really surprised that they wrote back. <laughs> and then their parents were really surprised that they wrote back as well. And I realized, oh, this is actually lovely for me, lovely for the child, lovely for the parent and also educational. And I thought, oh, that's funny that nobody's selling children's literature in uh, a way that children get really excited and giddy about. And that no one's selling children's literature in a way that prompts them to reply mm. and so then I had the idea for what I'm doing now and that's really the sort of last part of my life so in a way the dissatisfaction with the film industry and the kind of setup there and the process of developing films mm. over a three-year period kind of led to a really difficult time but then the best job in the world which is what I'm doing now. Thanks it's really nice to get, understand people's more life story rather than just talking about the thing they're doing straight away because you kind of miss the context and yeah like you sort of think okay well i'm not exactly just going to start doing something like what you're doing it seems sort of like too far away but then to understand like the process of how you got there suddenly sort of seems much more real and like understandable and you kind of see how 
maybe what you're doing doesn't seem great, but how it can be something awesome if you just sort of take the opportunity that you've made for yourself, but do something creative with it kind of thing. Yeah. And actually, like now you've come to say that, I realize that sort of everything you've ever done has kind of led mm. to this, not just film and, and the kind of disappointment of not enjoying it as sort of wonderful as it was to kind of work in that really rarefied environment with you know amazing people who are at the top of their game and you know sort of winging down the 405 on a sunny day with palm trees all over the place instead of being on the you know 13 bus and eventually rode in London as much as that sounded really fun I actually at the end wasn't enjoying it at all and so not only did that kind of lack of enjoyment lead to me to really sort of search for something that I really could love and didn't sort of loathe but my dad would write letters to me when I was a child so that was a sort of wake up on it started like on Valentine's Day there'd be a card next to my bed that he'd drawn like a tree with some hearts <laughs> as the fruit of the tree and then it was like little postcards and letters and, and I would reply and when I realized I think he said to me one time that I write a good letter and I, we were actually in New York and I remember saying to myself or him oh great well I'll do that then. <laughs> I'll just make a book of, I'll just, uh, I'll be a professional letter writer, which in some ways I am now, which is uh, yeah, so awesome. ironic. But yeah, all through my life, and, you know, and then I've loved children. I've been really interested in parenting for as long as I can remember. I remember sort of asking my best friend's mom how she made my best friend and her sister so brilliant. And she was very humble and said, oh, you know, they came out that way. They were just both really good kids. And I remember like as a child, being so interested in the home learning environment. Like what did Tasha's mum do that helped her be so level headed and how I even went through like a really sort of weird phase of watching Super Nanny obsessively because I was just so dazzled by the fact that this woman could walk into a house and I wasn't interested in the kind of car crash TV element of like people having a, a tough time. I was interested in like, I was like from a compassionate point of view I was, but I, I wasn't interested in the drama. I just found mm. it so amazing that someone could walk into a home, see what this child needed and what the parent needed and make some changes that could turn their whole world around. And then I've sort of been studying it in many different ways ever since, although ironically, I'm not a parent. So mm. it's, it's come to this that it's my business now and not my, you know, my job yeah. offline. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. So yeah, I've always. So do you think going to the girls' school helped a lot with like empowering you to sort of have more of a growth mindset and things? Oh, uh, I felt super liberated because I'm straight, that there were no distractions, and I think a lot of us felt that, like that we didn't have to dress up a certain way, at least Monday to Friday school hours, that our attention was on each other and our relationships and. Many, many of the years at our school who are now alum have said, God, those ties were so close. Like I'm still very close with the group of girls that I was friends with at school. We talk all the time. And so I can't speak to anything different. But I remember like as much as we hated it at the time and as much as it's probably a really unhealthy thing to do to put all these developmental <laughs> children into a space that's completely nothing like the outside world <laughs> where men and women live happily amongst yeah. each other. I can't criticize it too much because it gave me these incredibly close ties and friendships that were undiluted by all the complications that come with relationships, you know, with the opposite sex. And yeah, and actually also that it was outside of London as well. It just felt removed and a bit sort of felt quite safe. And it was a lovely school, very academic. I would say what didn't liberate us was the pressure to be incredibly successful and you know not even if you go to a school where everyone's really successful there are going to be people in the year that are less successful than the other successful ones like less still successful but a bit less successful and I think a lot of girls struggled with eating disorders and like throughout their life confidence issues and I was a late developer so I just assumed I was never going to be successful I just assumed I was like not one of the smart ones but I think I was smart I think I was just at a school where everyone was smart and I was like mm a late developer, smart one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so then when I went to university, I, I felt, oh, I can hold my own. I can, you know, I'm really interested in comedy. And I, I had some smart, funny friends. And I, I found my, my girls from school really smart and funny too. And I just sort of came into my own. And then when I went into my career in my 20s, which was in sort of commercial production and short film production and music videos and all that stuff, a lot of me and my girlfriends would kind of get together and we go, oh, I'm working for someone. And he's not as like, he's not as 
he's not as quick. We sort of felt like we could run rings around, which was sort of such a weird thing to not see coming. I thought I was stupid, but it turned out I wasn't. And it was quite a nice surprise at 21 to realize I wasn't <laughs> stupid. That's what I'm trying to say. Cool. All right. So keep the growth mindset. And then well, I guess this does relate to what you're doing now then. So when you're writing your letters, are you trying to like cultivate the kids to sort of be more growth mindset and these kind of things? Or is it more just to have fun conversation with them? Like what's the agenda of your letters exactly? To be a force for good in the world yeah. <laughs> is the vision. Yeah. So I was really influenced by Sesame Street growing up, partly because it was all about positivity and very kind of radical and, and pioneering in its sort of wish to teach children kindness and resilience and sharing and all that stuff, as well as the math and the English and everything else. So I loved that and have been influenced by that. So our letters were always supposed to be, I don't write them anymore, but they were originally written for my friends and their children. And so they had jokes for the adults and the, and the children in them. And then obviously they were written by a cat and they were signed off with a paw print. So that made the children really happy as well. But the main objective originally was just to be funny for both adult and child. And then we did a test with Mumsnet and we had 500 mums give us some feedback on the MVP of the product. And they were very consistent in wanting it to have more. So Banjo travels around the world and he goes to see the Taj Mahal and the Great Wall of China and Indonesia and Iceland. And the idea is he sends these real proper paper posts to children. Mm. So real physical letters arrive at their home every two weeks on a subscription business model. And the mum's net feedback on the MVP was, oh, this is great. Child loves it. Child's writing back. But can you put in more country facts, make it more educational when you go to Egypt? Can you talk about this, this and this? And so we added in country facts. And actually what we're realizing now, a few months later, is that children like a more narrative kind of whimsical letter. They, they need a kind of beginning, middle and end. And the older children are interested in the sort of country facts. But yes, running through all of our content is this sort of idea of how to be happy and, and a knowledge that like that doesn't lie in the information you hold in your brain about a country. It's, it's about kindness and empathy and Banjo writes in first person, so they're, and then the children write back to him in first person, so they're sort of learning to describe their feelings and articulate and communicate. And I think, you know, those are definitely, uh, you know, the core of our product and mm. something that, you know, we know now is so important. I was talking to a family yesterday who was saying that, you know, he has an office of three co founders, all men, and one of them's quite sort of tough and two are quite sensitive. And he finds it kind of quite refreshing and new that he can go in and have a conversation about how things are difficult for him with his other two male colleagues, which is something he wouldn't have done in another job. Or Yeah, so I think just communication and talking about your feelings, if we can just achieve that. <laughs> but definitely, yeah, we talk about friendship and kindness and resilience massively and very much following in the footsteps of Sesame Street's kind of research into how important that is. What do you think about social media? Do you have many asking to like follow you on sort of Instagram or something or do they kind of want to engage with like a social media presence of Banjo Robinson or are they happy with like letters or? Yeah, down the line, we'll have all sorts of different digital products. The younger children get a letter from Banjo and then he says, I'm going on a journey. Is there anywhere you'd like to go? And he gives them some stationery that they use to write back to him and they leave their letter underneath the sofa before they go to bed. And then in the morning it's disappeared. It's been collected overnight by Banjo or one of his friends and their personalized letters so he knows if you've got yeah, a dog yeah. called Pogo he knows he goes oh you live in Luke Street I know a black and white dog called Pogo I'll pick it up tonight when you go to bed if you leave me under the sofa so then you know they leave out sources of milk overnight for Banjo and then in the morning they get so excited about the absence of our product because the parents taking it from underneath the sofa so actually the younger children are very happy in the physical world and I think um very entertained and I think that's why parents really like the product is that it's very effective at that it kind of it is a nice fun thing it's kind of like writing to Father Christmas but all year round and it has that magic make-believe thing of Father Christmas and the tooth fairy and elf on the shelf but you know throughout the year but the older children want to be famous and so they want their replies to be on our Instagram feed and they want to be featured and they want Banjo to write a personal reply online and so definitely that's something that as we evolve the products for different age ranges, we are taking into account. Then we have this really fun other product coming out later this year, which is a, so the first product's quite geographical. They get a map and as, as Banjo travels around the world and they receive letters from each country, they get stickers for each country that they add to their map. And as the child gets older and grows out or finishes that adventure, 
we have another product which is historical cats. So uh, Banjo's uh, a cat. <laughs> I don't know if I mentioned that, but his great 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 grandfather is an Egyptian cat, or a you know a Russian Revolution cat, or an ancient Greek cat, or a Roman cat, and they send missives from different time periods. And so there's a kind of fun element to receiving that more kind of I suppose educational material that isn't magic and make believe, but which we can still enjoy. Cool. So how did you turn that into a business? So it was sort of you by yourself and you just writing left. Yeah, so I was writing them from my kitchen table and I did a three month study. So I got a bunch of friends, children and friends of friends, of which I kind of ignored the friends because I knew that they would be very nice and supportive. But I sent letters every, I think every two weeks for three months. The children didn't have a map to follow along with, which is a really key part of the adventure now. They really love having that sort of visual following his travels thing but anyway yep it was a resounding success and at some point I thought logistically it became quite difficult to keep them all on the same adventure so yeah I did a sort of very amateur survey and trial realized that it was really fun for the parent to see the child so animated about literacy and quite unusual to have the child who normally is a reluctant reading writer just jump up and run to get a pen and paper and write back to Manjo. So I realized there was a business in it and a friend of mine recommended that I call somebody I went to university with who'd done really well in business, Richard Moros, who's the founder of Move Business Cards. And Richard said, this isn't a kitchen table business. You should go and get some investment. And I was like, great, I'll do that then. <laughs> and then he said, you should go and meet with a friend of mine who I think would really like this, who is the MD of, of Venture Capital Fund. And I ended up meeting with him. He really liked it. It was too early stage, obviously, for anything like VC investment. But he put some personal money into it, as did Richard, as did a few other people that they introduced me to. And I actually had a very strange year where I think I pitched it 17 times and I got 14 people invested. So even though I didn't know anyone when I'd come back from America, I didn't know these were all friends of friends of Richard and his network. It was just, I think, the easiest fundraise anyone's ever done. The problem with it was just obsessed with this idea and I knew it was going to be successful. And if you were in a place of not having money, but having been given this like Fabergé egg of an idea and sort of feeling like it's precious and already fully formed, your job is just not to drop it. And so yeah. it didn't feel like I was climbing Everest. It just felt like I just had to, I had the thing already and I just had to like get it over the finish line. And of course there's no finish line, but anyway, eventually yeah. then, <laughs> long story short, then I struggled through that for a year, realized I needed to bring a team together, brought a team together to do another raise and that was a really good team and then somebody in my network introduced me to Eamon at Techstars and we got into Techstars and then the rest is history we we were one of 10 companies out of 1200 companies chosen for that program and suddenly your learning curve is fast and steep and now I feel confident I understand things and so we have a really outstanding team and incredible investors kind of our dream investors because Sesame Ventures is part of Sesame Workshop and Sesame Workshop developed Sesame Street and so it's kind of come full circle from when I was a kid Um, and they did the Sesame Workshop did the the sort of pioneering research that essentially was so smart because it said you've got TV and it's addictive and we all know it's addictive Mm. and that's that's not good is it and then Sesame Workshop and the the founders were saying, okay, well, it's addictive, but let's use that force for good. Let's make education addictive. Let's teach children about good stuff. And that's sort of very much what I want to help children sort of navigate their sort of literacy learning journey in a way that is fun and a game, you know, that Mm. is as fun and addictive as TV. So that's really nice. Really happy that you're doing this. (laughs) Thanks. Yeah, it feels exciting. And we've ended up with really great people involved because I think the idea resonates with people. That's cool. What do you think is going to be happening in like five years time in the fields of education and storytelling? I think there's going to be a lot more diversity. And I was reading recently that books and publishing, which I know more than the sort of broader educational scheme of things, 1% of characters are from a black and ethnic minority background. But 33% of children are from black, black and ethnic minority background. So all these children are growing up with heroes and stuff called Toby and Harry. And I think certainly in the publishing industry and children's publishing, that that is going to be a, a massive shift. Publishers like Night Solve are going to be not the exception. And so that's just something that's on my mind as you know, someone who's putting out lots of content to children. In education, I really hope that there's a move 
towards the kind of Montessori forest school <laughs> approach that they have in Finland, where you are letting children learn at their own speed. And then actually what they're learning in those sort of earlier formative years are the growth mindset skills that will set them up to be good learners later. It's one thing sort of reading to your child every night, but it's to get them to fall in love with reading and writing. If they fall in love with reading and writing, then later on they'll become avid readers and writers. And that's, yeah. that is what like the stats show us. And so really the aim is always fun first and foremost with banjo that is the move in education is not to kind of get children passing certain tests and accruing certain certain knowledge by the age of you know six they'll do their first assessment at the end of their first year when they're just like five turning six and I just think that's not an indicator of what they're going to be when they're 15 16 it can definitely if you start school late that lag between you and your peers compounds over time so if you start yeah. late then absolutely like you're not school ready and a lot of children from disadvantaged backgrounds don't start school school ready, inverted commas. Those children will be impacted throughout their life. And I really hope that work is done in the sort of home learning environment, but also those sort of early years at school to get a sense of fun and confidence and resilience and some of those interpersonal skills so that the children will be happier and kind of mentally healthier so that later on in their educational career they are more effective learners and that's what happens in you know Finland where they'll they'll really kind of take the pressure off all the kind of academia and then those children are very behind on the sort of the test that they do at each year you know they'll they'll be they'll, they'll sort of look like they're lagging behind academically but then they massively catch up you know in their mm. teens and they end up being I think one of the most effective education systems in the world you know those children graduate with the knowledge that they need but it's a process that has like a different phases I mean I suppose I remember like learning that stuff actually weirdly through Sesame Street when I was a kid but I don't ever remember learning that at school that was the biggest influence was you had a really sort of positive teacher that was impactful if you had a really negative teacher that was impactful too and you learned how not to do it or you suffered as you learned that lesson but yeah I think I'm a really big believer in you know if you've got a big problem look at people who are doing it well so you know if you've got a country that's sort of got a system in place that works i would model our system on that country that's yeah. the first thing i would do if i was you know in power but i think our government is definitely focused on the impact of putting investment into home learning environment so i hope there are more books involved and that's the nice thing about banjo as well is it's basically books but send mm. you know instead of printing forty thousand books um, yeah. over the course of a year we take the same writers these wonderful children's authors and we have them write a letter in an afternoon and then we print it a few days later in a piece of paper, or paper. it's the same content so what I'd like to do with Banjo is have letters going out to children from disadvantaged areas who maybe aren't going to the library every two weeks or maybe aren't being read to every night at bedtime because everyone has two jobs or maybe they're not being bought books a couple of weeks, brought into the home. And to sort of get that literary content into their yeah. home through Ooh. letters. How would, that, that would you look, do you personalise the letters that you send or is like the first paragraph relates to what the children sent you and then the rest of it is kind of like a, this is the, pa- the no. letter from kind of thing and that's yeah so they always start with uh, you know I'm writing to you from up a tree in Mexico or I'm writing to yeah. you from you know a boat in the Atlantic or whatever and then we take when the parent subscribes we take personalization data from the parents so the child's name address and the color of your sofa child's favorite activity favorite meal and a couple other things and we pepper those through the letters so we know if you've got a cat called Emily we know that you know we know that Emily is a tortoiseshell female cat and we'll talk about her in the letters but then the platform allows parents to answer the child's question so we don't do it so if a child reads the letter from Egypt and in return writes back to Banjo and says you know it's great to learn about the Nile I've been to Spain have you ever been to Spain then the parent can through our platform add a paragraph to the end of the next letter which allows them to answer that question so the letters are reciprocal back and forth throughout the year so there's personalization both in the literature or literary content Did of the letter get the letter back with the parent no like that's the it. thing yeah so right so, so the smart. parent keeps I get it. it yeah, yeah, so, yeah. The parent, <laughs> so basically the parents point of view is they you know sign up give us some personalization details yeah. the letters arrive um in the post once every two weeks the child will read the letter from the country it has personalization data in that letter so they get really blown away that we know yeah. you know where they live and that their favorite food is their grandmother's you know spaghetti or whatever and they get really really excited when we know their pet when banjo's friends with their pet and then he always asks a question or prompts an activity they write back they leave their reply onto the sofa the parent keeps it so at the end of the year the parent has a sort of stack of their child's first writing for the cat and then 
but they can go on our platform or reply a link, which adds a paragraph. So we, what we end up with, and this is a nice sort of closed loop, is that we end up with parents sometimes answering questions like, yes, cats do have birthday parties, you know, or my favorite color is orange because the child's asked what's your favorite color or, you know, if they have, if cats have birthday parties. But we also get parents using that paragraph the way my dad would write to me as a child. So, you know, just encouraging messages like, oh, Tawanda, you can do anything you want, you know, I believe in you, you're my best cat friend. Or, well done on getting a gold star in gymnastics. That's fantastic. I love your handwriting's coming on so well. Or sometimes they go on a bit of a tangent and they're like, they forget that they're writing in the voice of banjo and they'll go like, you know, don't forget to tidy your room. <laughs> Stop arguing with your sister. <laughs> you know, all that stuff. So it can be quite funny, but they're gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous messages from the parents. Yeah. Oh, that sounds really, really nice. I kind of like want kids just to... <laughs> I know, it's so sweet. I can't believe I get to do this for a living. Yeah. And also, I did have a job once where uh, with some colleagues who I now work with, and we used to laugh because all I ever wanted to do was sort of show them animal videos on YouTube. Mm. I mean, I did, I did work quite hard, but like, you know, that was a good sort of pressure valve. And, uh, and we used to joke that, you know, really what would suit me as a career would be looking at animal videos on YouTube. And it turns out <laughs> that is part of my job now. Oh, that sounds lovely. Amazing. But okay. there's also, there's business too. It's a mm. business. So we spoke about putting a team together and one thing I've learned is that like it's not so hard if you've got like a really cool thing that you're doing as in people always like oh how do you get good developers or how do you get sort of amazing people to write for you or whatever it's like if you have a really cool thing that you're doing then people kind of just want to go and do it these days like having more purpose do you do you have much experience with like problems around this or do you think it just was quite easy because you, you had such a full purpose and that people kind of bought into it problems around what like the mechanics of getting yeah, us like, to market or problems getting people involved i think i had a pretty easy time of getting people involved hmm. i do because do you have any co-founders now was it just no it's then? it's a you know core team and so we're six people full-time and three part-time and some freelancers so are you constantly creating new content in terms of the lessons and things? Yeah, so every two weeks, as things happen in the world, like Banjo will really be there. So like he'll be in India at Diwali or, you know, Mardi Gras, he'll be in New Orleans or we have a schedule of where he'll be in 2020. I think he's going to Zimbabwe next. Wow. Um, so then our social media will reflect. You know, what do you doing. send someone to Zimbabwe to like, do you feel kind of like... Do, like <laughs> we will. <laughs> we will down the line. There'll be yeah, a, so a... If big... you want someone to go, yeah, that's <laughs> you are. Well, we want a kind of a... There's a, there's a few different... It's such a lovely... Career. I can tell them about that. Oh, that's so funny. One of my bosses, who was a bit mad, said that I should go and see his own personal psychic or something. Mm. And so I went to the psychic and he drew a map across... He drew, had like, he took my date of birth and my star sign and all that stuff and I sort of sensed it was nonsense at the very beginning but what I loved was that at the end he drew a map across the globe with a sort of vector across it which you know was sort of the angle of all the dates I'd given him and he said these are all countries this this line cross sex you know countries which are auspicious for you and it went right through North Korea mm. <laughs> and I was like oh yeah great okay I'll move to North Korea and I'm sure that's gonna work out really well it is quite nice what was it like when you were there what was the did you get you had a chaperone yeah yeah you have a chaperone it's very clean as a country there's no like rubbish and there's no advertising which is just quite refreshing for your brain to not be constantly thinking about other things and yeah you're like good enough or if you need like better hair products or to watch this movie or something. yeah yeah and you just like you just you and there's just nice buildings and there's people that, and that's that so it's kind of quite refreshing you, know, you never realize how much stuff is in your brain all the time from all this thing yeah that's there did and you then, feel like you were seeing the real North Korea? Yeah, because it was really unorganized and like you could see what it was that they were trying to show you. Okay, and that in itself yeah, is a choice, Yeah, it was right. kind of like watching yeah. like a really bad movie and you can kind of see like the special effects that are there or something. It's sort of, you can right, see what they're doing. Right, right, right. And we're kind of just a bit cute in that sense. And But like the people that you should have meet, it kind of, because we still got to like see randomers. You know, we went on the tube, we went around like shopping malls where we just left left there for like a few hours and, and everyone is just sort of they kind of just look at you more like aliens rather than tourists as such and they're just really interested rather than they don't try and sell you anything they're just fascinated to like know what the hell a white person is like from the rest of the world yeah they're not like oh yeah. buy my like toy car take away my tax or whatever right, right and so it's quite nice they're just quite genuine and seem kind of content and happy mostly although you can see that they're really like really poor and there's lots of people that are like stunted growth and really like oh, feeling yeah. so there's no fat people right um, yeah but 
like they don't really spend all their time on their phones because they mostly haven't got phones and yeah. social media and things and, yeah. and like they're still a bit it's sort of like being held back from stuff that we have but i'm not sure if some of the things have really helped us you know like in the modern world we are much more depressed and you know we have all these things that we think we need and want and we're kind of running around in a constant state of stress where they're a bit more like happy and content to have like the life plan for them and to sort of chill out more and to spend more time with family and do like more rewarding things yeah. and you're like oh, yeah. yeah maybe we've kind of gone a bit too far with what we're doing and sure like very oppressive communism isn't perhaps the best way to go about it but like, <laughs> right. there's some lessons from North Korea that we could maybe take on board yeah. that would actually be helpful kind of thing that's so interesting I'm so interested in that so I-, I like to ask people what is the kindest thing that someone's done for them when I came back from America I think my best friend she's just very kind always just her presence <laughs> mm. her friendship over my lifetime there are so many like last night I hadn't had lunch and I hadn't had dinner and my colleague um heated some food up for me and brought it and I said no no no, I'm fine I'm fine I didn't I didn't want her to do that and she like saw that I was just tired and had been working really hard and hadn't been looking after myself and so she was very kind and looked after me <laughs> it was very nice of her and then I realized afterwards oh she like got home late she wouldn't have seen her kid go to bed and that she didn't need to do that just good people I'm like really moved by little things like somebody whose job it isn't to put flowers in my room or you know my dad to take some time to write me a letter to let me know that he loves me and thinks I'm you know cool and cares about me you know little things I'm really into those little kindnesses and then what would you say is like your earliest distinct memory I remember my dad climbing a mountain in the Pyrenees on a family holiday. We were in France in the mountains. And I think we'd had a really typical kind of like 80s French picnic, like a baguette and some salami. It was a bit windy, but very beautiful, that kind of thing. And a bit cold, but sunny. Anyway, it felt like in the middle of nowhere environment with this sort of basic food stuff of like bread and meat. And then my dad went to climb this mountain. I think it was just a hill. It took him a while to come to the other side and we couldn't see him. And I remember thinking that he was gone and that he had died. And it, I reacted like a screaming banshee. I was just, I reacted with this absolutely wild grief. And I just remember the feeling of losing my dad. And then he just came around the mountain and it was fine. But I don't know, when I look back on it, it was just so like elemental. There was a mountain, mm. there was some food. There were the three people in the world that I knew at that age. And I knew nothing else. I knew what country I was in, but I didn't know what was beyond this landscape. I had no friends. I was five. I didn't have an opinion. I was just a little five-year-old. And suddenly one of the three people in my life went away and my life went to two people and nothing else. And this bread and this salami. And it turned out that wasn't enough. (laughs) It turned out you need more than that. You need more than two people and a sandwich to be happy. And I expressed that loudly that day huh? <laughs> you think that's a, maybe part of where the reason why your dad sends you so many letters he's right. <laughs> he might be missing him or something yeah when he lives in the same house as me yeah no he's just a, he's just the kindest person I've ever met in my whole life he's up there I would say like my best friend is up there with him in terms of kindness they're both angels okay cool <laughs> this has been lots of fun thanks. thank you very much for making the time thanks very much for having me on the show I hope you enjoyed the episode as much as I did. My goal for this podcast is to help make people happier and wiser. And I'm also working on a few other projects in the podcasting space to achieve the same thing. I run the Wiser Than Yesterday podcast with a friend where we read and discuss a great non-fiction book a week. Talk about things like philosophy, psychology, the economy, self-improvement and business. Books such as The Black Swan, Anti-Fragile, Invisible Women, how to win friends and influence people. It's a great resource. I also run the Curious Comforts podcast, finding out what's going on in the world and how to improve it with industry insiders. We've been focusing on the effects of the coronavirus lately, but I also discuss broader things like climate change and AI. Thanks for listening. Congratulations on listening to a whole episode of the Growth Mindset podcast. Before you race into another podcast, try pausing. Ask yourself, what have you learned? What could you change? How will you make that change happen? Did you press pause? Knowledge is useless without action. What did you learn? What should you change? And how will you make that change happen? You can tell us what you learned by contacting us through the website, growthmindsetpodcast.com. 
and feel free to connect with us or our guests or just peruse the show notes. Our Instagram is at Growth Mindset Podcast or follow me at Sam Jam Snaps for a daily reminder to stop using Instagram. If you enjoy random acts of kindness and want to support the show, you can support us on Patreon or leave us a review on iTunes and you'll make me very happy. And with that, keep learning and keep growing.